Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. Today, I'm joined by my friend Brad, who's here with Das Financial, and he's going to be talking to us about um, some tax stuff with farming and things that you need to know if you're starting your new farm business. So, Brad, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, you um, are actually my personal slash business accountant, so you um, are pretty familiar with this farm stuff we've been working together for a couple years now so i know that um this the farm stuff is pretty familiar to you even though it it can be a little bit confusing to people like me so thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today yeah i uh i love the talk so i figured this was a great opportunity yeah (laughs) well i don't like to talk so (laughs) (laughs) feel free to to take it away um well My name is Brad Doss. I'm from Pueblo, Colorado, born and raised. Um, I started my uh, accounting company roughly three years ago. Um, I started out with just uh, 12 bookkeeping clients and I've just slowly grown. I think I'm over 40 bookkeeping clients and 60 or 70 tax clients and stuff. So I got my degree out at CSU Pueblo out here. I am not a CPA, which is a little reminder, I guess. I'm not a CPA. I can still do pretty much anything a CPA can do. The only thing I can't do is tax returns and bookkeeping for publicly traded companies. So I guess if your farm is publicly traded, I'm not going to be too much of a help to you, (laughs) but the chances of that are probably pretty slim anyway. Yeah, I don't think so. I've yet to to see anyone that is a publicly traded company, let alone a farm. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, that's that's a little background of me. Awesome. Um, and you're able to provide um, like this information is applicable to people outside of Colorado, right? It's not just yeah state specific. Yeah. So uh, the federal laws apply to all fifty states. Um, as far as bookkeeping and accounting wise, it's it your your federal side is going to be consistent. Um, every state has uh, every state has separate laws. So there might be a couple differences from state to state, which I haven't done a return in every single state, obviously, but the ones I have done, uh, I haven't seen anything special for farming, but that's not to say that there isn't something special in in, in a state. So, but it's something that is easily, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. You can figure it out. If you look at the return, you can see what kind of benefits farming might have for you at the end of the year on the return and and see something like that so but yeah i'm pretty pretty useful <laughs> I, yeah i think so <laughs> i use you regularly <laughs> so if somebody wanted to um take their farm and turn it into more of a business instead of a hobby what's kind of the difference um on your end of the world as far as as business versus you know entertainment purposes so with the uh with the uh, tax laws that were implemented in 2018 basically uh quote-unquote hobby farming has no benefit to you on a tax side you can't take any hobby farming losses anymore um so it kind of makes it uh, it kind of makes it to where you have to be a little bit more um direct with what you're trying to do i guess in that sense um, the key is to not call it a hobby farm and just call it a business. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that helps you a lot and you can actually still then benefit from that. And there's a couple kind of rules. There's a couple surefire rules that will consider you as a business and not as a hobby farm. And then there's also some that are left up to interpretation that can still classify you as a business. So if you do show losses, you can benefit from those losses. Because um, most farms show loss. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so what does somebody need to do to be officially titled as a business? Like, you know, is it just having uh, registered with the state as a business? 
Um, not necessarily. Um, having an LLC definitely helps you legitimize. But the so the IRS has what they call safe harbor rules. Um, and if you do that, then you will be guaranteed to be considered a business for profit and not necessarily a hobby farm. Uh, one of the rules is that if you have a positive taxable income for three out of five years. So if you lose money two years and three straight years, you have a profit or any combination of that. It's under the safe harbor rule. So you are guaranteed to be considered a business and all of your your losses and stuff can be taken or carried forward. Um, that's kind of a general one. There's a random one too that I found that actually, if you're in the horse breeding, if you're into horses, breeding, racing, anything like that, show horse, um, you can deduct up to all of your profit. You can't actually yeah. show a loss, but you can take all of your profit every year. <laughs> so that's a random little tidbit of yeah, that. Yeah, so those one. are the, <laughs> yeah, that's the safe, that's the guaranteed way to to be considered a business. And then there's some other ways that um, are up for interpretation, I guess you could say. Okay. <laughs> um, there's basically the, the best way is to, if you have to, con the best way would be to conduct it, quote unquote, in a business manner, which would basically be... Um, you know, have good bookkeeping and good record keeping, have an LLC set up at least with the state, even if you don't have an EIN number. Um, <clears throat> and the biggest thing is to show that you are attempting to make an income at least um, through, you know, if you're marketing your products or um, you're going to trade shows or you're going to farmers markets and stuff like that, to actually show that you're trying to create an income instead of just raising some goats out in the farm and then taking their feed and writing it off when it's really not, and you sell two things of goat milk or something a year. That's not sure. going to really benefit you. Um, another one that is pretty specific for, like, you is to, if you have uh, expertise in the activity. So I would say you're a pretty pretty expertise in the beekeeping industry for sure after listening to some of your <laughs> podcasts well thank you i think you have the drake one and you're like oh well you can't put it in a tree yeah you can't <laughs> yeah. well the thing is with bees they can travel up to nine miles and yeah. <laughs> so that uh something like that is definitely can be considered um spending enough time to justify that it's a business and not a hobby uh, if you just feed your goats for 10 minutes, I don't know why I keep using goat references, but <laughs> it works. I think it's because I had someone come to me this year that had a goat oh. farm, so it's kind of stuck in my head. <laughs> but um, um, spending enough time to be considered a business and not a hobby. And that's um, kind of the subjective thing where they don't say, well, you need to spend five hours a day or something yeah that's the great thing about the irs is a lot of their laws are so open well it's a good and a bad thing um a lot of it is left up to interpretation so there there's no set time limit per day it's just whatever you can justify i guess mm -hmm. i would say something that's at least part-time hours between 15 to 20 hours a week sure. or something like that that's pretty easy <laughs> Yeah, it adds up. And if you're really a legitimately a business and you're trying to make money, you'll easily do oh, yeah. 15 to 20 hours a week, I would think. Um, and one of them that's kind of the last one I was had a note of was your financial status can kind of affect it. So a lot of times if you're a rich and wealthy person and you make a lot of money, uh, you're always looking for tax breaks or ways to bring your income down so if you make a lot of money and then you show a very large farming loss they're definitely going to look at you more because you have the money to cover the loss whereas benefits you on the taxes uh, if you're more of like a middle class person they assume that basically you don't have all this extra money to keep losing every year on farming so it kind of would legitimize it a little bit more for you. Gotcha. Um, I think most real farmers uh, typically are not on the wealthy end. <laughs> yeah, I uh, at least not like an annual 
yeah. big income. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So I think uh, there's a lot of farmers that are very wealthy, but it, it took time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, yeah. With, with time, you can get there, but most of us aren't so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a very tedious business. And yeah. not it's not like the quick path to success or, or to wealth i should say not success nope. but wealth and success are different <laughs> especially if it's a uh, smaller scale i think i think you just enjoy living impoverished <laughs> <laughs> so you can still have a job and farm at the same time and still be considered a farm business yeah absolutely yeah like i said either meet the safe harbor rule and maybe you maybe you move some depreciation expenses or, or some kind of deductions you might move them all to one year so you might buy like a piece of machinery you really need and instead of depreciating it over five or seven years take it all in the first year and show a big loss that year but the next year you'll show an income <laughs> to try to get the three years of of positive income out of the five so you can do stuff like that, and that'll definitely um, legitimize everything for you. And I think, honestly, most people, around here at least, um, more like small-scale farming kind mm -hmm. of, they, they usually have jobs outside of what they do. And right. It start, a lot of times it started out as a hobby, and now it's growing to like a legitimate business. Mm -hmm. So. And then if none of that makes sense to you, which you just said, we can always just have you do it for us. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> or you can, yeah, just bug me. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I'm i a dork. I like to go through IRS tax code. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, and uh, farming is something that's pretty specific, honestly, and there's, there's a lot of special rules for farming. It has its own separate tax form on your return, Schedule F, and it, um, it's, it's, separate from a lot of the other tax world so it can get kind of confusing mm -hmm. and and taxes are changing every year so you definitely want to try to stay on top of it and be working with some type of tax professional um i wouldn't recommend to do it just once a year like a bookkeeping thing a lot of times people just save their receipts all year and then go to h and r block or something at the end of the year and then just hope for the best um, I think that honestly, a lot of times you're probably going to be missing out on a lot of your, your expenses and deductions and, and possibilities really. I know that in the years past before I met you, we had used other, um, either tax programs and done it ourselves or other individuals and they weren't always completed correctly. And then recently in the process of applying for the USDA loan, they were very pleased to see that you filed a Schedule F for us. That really helped us a lot. Something that the previous people did not do, so that was super helpful. Yeah, I think a lot of times they just put it as a normal Schedule mm -hmm. C or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's exactly what they did. And um, on, the, on your tax return, there's a box in there where you have to classify what your business is by code. And they take those codes and they compare them throughout all of the tax returns. So every single business with that code gets compared and all the outliers are higher chance of audit. So if you were to do a farming tax return on a Schedule C, you probably are going to be raising your risk of audit because your numbers are going to be so much different than someone else that might be doing a similar thing but not necessarily farming. So. You might be showing like an eight thousand dollar loss and the average for that industry is like twenty thirty thousand dollar net income or something mm -hmm. so it's going to definitely raise flags for you so yeah that's why it's important to definitely be on top of it because uh and farming is kind of one of the things where there is a lot that's like up to judgment so basically if you ever were to get audited you're guilty until proven innocent it's not the other way around so um <laughs> that's lovely if they uh yeah if they um if they decide to audit you and you can't prove some of your expenses or you can't prove some of the stuff that's going on uh you could be hit with a pretty rough tax bill sure so, and a lot of, 
a lot of times they take two or three years to get around to it, but they definitely will in in yeah, they will definitely add up all your fees for those two or three years that you thought you were good mm. to. So <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like any fun. No, it's not. No one wants a big tax bill. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it's <laughs> Yeah, and it was really a bummer if you really did lose five thousand dollars, and then you have a yeah. five thousand dollar tax bill because your accountant filed the Schedule C instead of Schedule F or something, something really small like that. Sure. IRS audits aren't too fun to deal with, so I would recommend to avoid them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, really, the best thing is is just record keeping for everything that you do. That's the best way to legitimize any business you're doing especially in farming though mm -hmm. what else you got for me i thought you had the notes <laughs> well i ran out of notes <laughs> <laughs> fresh out of notes um so if somebody wanted to start a farming business a upgrade from a hobby other than um you know maybe getting an llc and hooking up with somebody like you um, to help with the bookkeeping. Is there anything else that they should do? Well, as far as the LLC and legitimizing the business, um, you're good to go. But I think that what you should look at is if it's actually worth your time and money to even make it a business. That's um, a good point. If you are just, if, it, if you are doing it and you want the tax break, but you're, you you know you're just going to keep losing money. It might not benefit you to keep growing something if you just keep losing a ton of money. Sure. If you don't see like a true end game, um, I had like I said I had people that had a goat farm and they try to sell goat milk for two years and they just kept losing money more than anything and and it's kind of like, I mean you can still sell your goat milk sparingly you want but maybe not go so full-fledged into it it's mm -hmm. it's like any other business you really have to make sure that it's worth your time um so you know sit down and i i always say at least give it a couple years or something and see where it goes and mm -hmm. you never know it might turn into something else or it might sure. it might be worth it it might not be worth it I, it's it's hard to say uh with like social media and everything i mean really anything can can grow to extreme numbers mm -hmm. so it's always worth a shot but don't uh i guess don't uh don't stick around just for like tax breaks because it could come back and bite you if you don't sure from from a tax standpoint and from a personal finance standpoint yeah well, yeah so uh and with the farming i don't remember if you mentioned this already but is there um a maximum number of years that you can show losses before the IRS is like, yeah, it's time to do something different. Uh, there's not a maximum number or anything. Mm -hmm. No, you can theoretically. Now, most big, big farms, uh, most of them will show a loss every single year, honestly. Um, and that's, that's totally normal because they can justify that they're doing real business by the mm -hmm. other ways that they're doing it. And a lot of times they, have like the loans or if you're raising cattle you get usda loans and stuff like that and once by the time you write off everything a lot of times you do show a loss oh. and you can show a loss like every year but a lot of the loss that you're taking isn't like actual money you spent i sure. guess you could say it's not money lost in the grand scheme of things yeah only on a tax side from a cash flow side the cash is still there and that's why you keep doing it and mm -hmm. then that's legitimate too so but um that's like on big scale farms too. If you do, if you're doing something smaller and you lose, if you keep, if you're doing something smaller and losing, like if you only sell five hundred dollars worth of chickens or something, and then you have a ten thousand dollar loss, like that's not gonna fly. Yeah. But if you're doing three hundred thousand dollars in cattle sales, and then you still have a little bit of a loss for like ten thousand a year or something, that's sure. that's legitimate. Yeah. So there's a difference between real life losses and losses on paper on on the tax side, I guess. Yeah. So like if you buy feed <laughs> or something like that, like yeah. that's a loss and you incurred it and you actually spent the money. But if you have like a farm truck and it depreciates every year, 
that depreciation isn't really something you're paying out of pocket it's just a loss in value but on the tax side it comes out as a big number so oh, okay. you know what i mean so yeah that makes more sense. there's like depreciation um interest on loans you actually pay the interest but mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like it kind of because yeah <laughs> most people just pay the one payment and then it splits up so um stuff like that or um you know cattle cattle loss or something mm-hmm. you know your cattle die and you don't you know whatever you paid for it you can write it off but it's kind of might have been a it might have been something that an expense you incurred two years ago and then the cattle died or something like mm-hmm. that so there's different kind of stuff like that that really changes the taxes gotcha that makes sense stuff that i don't really think about since you do it for me yeah <laughs> here's my receipts that's, make it make it work that's how it happens yeah, yeah. <laughs> i try to keep people uh, at least uh, educated on like the minimum of what they're what's going on but yeah there's a lot of like background stuff and mm-hmm. honestly a lot of people don't really care anyway they're just like yeah <laughs> whatever just make what's, it work <laughs> what's the number at the end yeah yeah <laughs> they have a question and they'll ask me but most people are just like yeah exactly yeah please make it work yes and put, make it make it painless yes i already have <laughs> enough going on i don't need to mess with numbers yeah. <laughs> and see that's all i do all day long <laughs> i'd rather go clean chicken coops every day and i'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny i i always tell my uh, fiance that i need to go buy a work truck because i really want a truck <laughs> there you go <laughs> but i would call it a work truck and she's like you work at an office <laughs> well as long as you sit in the truck and send an email then it's maybe truck. maybe that's the key <laughs> <laughs> i mean i gotta drive i gotta get to work somehow right mm-hmm. <laughs> definitely <laughs> so that's actually the thing yeah maybe i just need to get more like farming clients that way i can take my truck to an actual farm oh, there, there you go, go. meet Do with them on site meetings yeah the sob can't make it through the dirt road so (laughs) that's how i'll legitimize it to her perfect (laughs) so if you're starting a business or starting your farm as a business what is the best way to file it with the state i know that like we are an llc but i know there's other options so what's kind of the pros and cons of of those so an LLC is basically only for a state level. There's no tax retu- tax return for an LLC because they can be taxed multiple different ways. So a lot of times if you're first starting a company, the best bet is to get an LLC through the state that you're in um, and then be taxed as a sole prop. Um, so when you get your EIN number, it'll ask you what is your company structure. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're smaller and you're just starting out, it's definitely best to have an LLC taxed as a sole proprietorship. Can you be a sole proprietor if you have multiple people in the business? So like if it was me and my husband. So yeah, I was going to say if, if you have two people or something, it's going to have to be a partnership, Mm. which you set up as a partnership from a tax standpoint, you'll have a whole separate tax return for your partnership, but it's still taxed as if there's a sole prop because you still pay your self-employment tax on it. Oh, okay. Um, and usually that's the, those are the two best ways to start out um, because once you switch to like a corporation, you have to start running payroll and stuff on yourself. Oh. So start, get the LLC made, start as a sole prop or a partnership if you're going to be in business with other people. Um, once your net income, so your bottom dollar income per year, once that's getting around forty to fifty thousand dollars, that's when it's going to be more beneficial to switch the company to an S corporation. Which all you have to do is just fill out two forms and send them into the IRS before March fifteenth of each year, and that will reclassify you as a corporation and then as an S corporation. Oh, okay. Um, so once you are an S corp, you have to, all of the officers of the company have to be on a salary. Hmm. So every year, every month you get paid X amount of dollars. And the, the main benefit from an S corp to an LLC is you avoid self-employment tax. So say your company makes $50,000 net income and you're 
you would have to pay 15% plus income tax, which is can be from 12 to 30% or whatever it is, based on any other income you have um, on that $50,000. Whereas if you're an S Corp owner, you pay yourself a salary of say 32,000 a year so you pay your 15%, which is your payroll taxes, on the 32, but then the 18,000 above it is only on is only income tax, no payroll tax. Hmm. Um, so that's where you start saving it. But once you're an S corp, you're officially become an employee of the company as well as an owner, and so you have to have work comp or not work comp. You have to have uh, unemployment oh. on yourself. So. You pay $42 a year for unemployment for the feds and then whatever your state rate is. In Colorado, it they give you a percentage, usually around 2% on the first $13,100 you pay yourself. So it's a pretty small amount. It's like mm-hmm. another two fifty a month. But you have to have unemployment on yourself as an owner hmm. and an employee of your business. So that's kind of silly. But if you ever close your business, you can file for unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you have an um, can you have employees under an LLC? Uh, yeah. So you don't need to be an S corp to have employees. Okay. Uh, you can still be a sole prop, <laughs> and you can hire people as employees. You do have to set up a couple different um, payroll accounts and stuff like that with the feds and with the state that you're in. Um, but you can do that. You do. You will need an EIN number though in order to have employees. So, um, if you're just running a sole prop under your social security number, uh, once you get, once you start hiring people, then you need to go get an EIN number, Gotcha. set it up that way. But I would recommend, I mean, it's really simple and pretty cheap to get a company set up. Um, in the Colorado, it's a $50 fee and I, I usually do company setups for 150 plus $50 reimbursement. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it's pretty cheap and it gives you a lot of added protections and it legitimizes and it allows you to keep your business and your personal stuff separate too. You can have like a separate bank account for the farm. You got a solid of your personal and I usually just recommend people get them at the same bank and they can just transfer money to their personal if they want to buy something, something like that. So, um, yeah, if you're going to do something and go into business, definitely just get an LLC like I said 200 bucks will get you there and it's definitely worth it well and if I understand it correctly and this is kind of the reason that I got the LLC before I met you with the bees and stuff because if something happened and somebody was to sue you and tell me if this is incorrect and you have an LLC then they can only sue the business right and your personal stuff's kind of protected a little bit yeah um yeah that's that's part of the corporate protection that you get is they can only go after the business if something happened Mm -hmm. that creates you liable for your business um drake will probably tell you that there's a way around it it's called piercing the corporate veil and so that's how come you definitely want to try to keep your business and personal expenses separate because even if you have a business account but you're making a lot of personal purchase out of it Mm -hmm. then if you were to go to court or a lawsuit they can argue that um your there's no separation between your company and your personal stuff and they can go after you but that being said um if you don't have a lot of assets to protect anyway if you are renting a farm or something you don't if you don't have a lot to protect it's not really a big deal because they're if they sue you, then what are they going to get out of yeah. you? But, I mean, if, if you have a, a bigger operation or, like, big machinery or something that has a lot of value in it, whether it's equity or a lot of cash in the bank, yeah, it's definitely better to have an LLC and protect it sure. at least um, and keep your personal stuff, keep your house away from any kind of lawsuits yeah. and stuff like that. That would be unfortunate if you lost everything, you know, it'd be unfortunate to lose your business, but to become homeless out of the deal too would be, yeah. <laughs> be unfortunate. That'd be a real bummer. It would be. At yeah. least you, <laughs> hopefully you know how to raise chickens so you can eat a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's under the bridge with you and some chickens. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sounds delightful. <laughs> I don't know how well the chickens 
would survive. <laughs> you have to snuggle up everybody at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want. I really would. I really want some. Uh, some goats. Me too. I know, they're so cute, right? They're like little dogs almost. Yes. They have creepy eyes though. A little bit. <laughs> and the Lamanches have the little, the little tiny ears. Those ones are kind of. Have you seen those ones? I don't think so. I'll have to. I'll have to show you a picture. We we can't have goats with our covenant. Oh, I was going to ask you if you had any or not. I'd literally like milk goats, um, but also because of our um, my 48-hour fire shifts, you have to milk goats too frequently. And oh. my husband's very patient, but asking him to go milk a goat <laughs> twice a day might be pushing it. <laughs> yeah, those are those are so cute. I but, just, yeah. I I was at the zoo in Kansas last weekend. And there was, like, some demonic goat there, but he was, like, the cutest demonic goat ever. Like, he had one, he had one horn coming out of the right side, and then he had, like, a horn stub on the left side, and oh. then he had a third horn going straight, like, horizontal, and he had two big old buck teeth. Oh. Like, he had some deformities, but he... <laughs> oh. I was like, I just want to take you home. I, I you just could sleep in the them. bed. Yeah, I yeah, I sleep in the bed. Did you smell the goats? <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> I'm sure your fiance would love that. Oh yeah, I, I don't think so. She doesn't really like. <laughs> she likes. She likes animals from afar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, ever since I, I've always wanted chickens, but I'm way more open to the idea of. Maybe I'll have my own farm one day. You should. I'll have a Schedule F on my return. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you need help with chickens or bees, I got you covered. <laughs> I've never been stung by a bee, so I'm scared because I don't know. What if I'm allergic? So, the first time you're stung, you cannot have an allergic reaction because you have to be exposed to an allergen for your body to build up the antigens and to make yourself allergic to it. So most people are stung multiple times. A lot of beekeepers, um, you know, they're beekeeping like 20 years and all of a sudden they get that sting that does them in because your body, um, you know, bodies are weird and they kind of do their own thing. But um, I, and I wrote like this whole long blog post on this actually that gets a little scientific because the paramedic in me enjoys this topic, but it's a good crossover. It, yeah. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, so you can't be allergic to something that you've not been exposed to. However, after one sting or your first exposure, at any time, your body has the possibility, not guaranteed, but the potential to have an anaphylactic reaction to it. So if I get stung once, I'm good. Your first one's good. First one's free. Now, you say at any time. Does that mean, like, I have to get stung again or, like... Yeah. Oh, okay. So, after you've been exposed and your body builds up the defense, then in subsequent stings, usually your body's like, oh, okay, we've had this before, whatever. But every now and then, and it's like 3 to 5% of the adult population in the U.S., they'll get that sting that, for whatever reason, their body just has a full histamine response and then that's when you'll have the anaphylactic response. That's scary. And that's what I don't like, like the bummer about beekeeping and, it, you know, you could be out in the middle of the field and, you know, you've been keeping bees for 20 years and, and all of a sudden, you know, you've been stung thousands of times, but it's that one time that your body has that full-fledged response to it. Wow. And there's no way really to, like, determine whether or not that's going to be the one if you have an atopic, what is it called? Uh, a, it's atopic conditions. I can't remember the word, but it's like eczema, asthma, or something else. I forget which the three of them are. Then you're predisposed. You're more likely to have it. And women, for some reason, and if you pre-medicate, like if you take a Benadryl before you go out and work your bees and then you get stung, those are some things that can kind of potentially push you into an anaphylactic response. But so taking medicine before can make it worse, huh? Yeah, I don't know if it's it. I don't remember the details of it, um, but it like chart like precharges your body to have a f 
a more extreme response to a sting. So a lot of people think, oh, if I take a Benadryl before, then then it'll like because most of the time when people get stung, you know, it just gets red and itchy and uncomfortable. So people, if they were like, oh, I don't want to be red and itchy and I might get stung, so I'll take a Benadryl to prevent that. Well, that could potentially cause an anaphylactic response. So can they sting you in the suits? Yeah, it depends on the suit. So I wear just like a cotton suit and in they're a budget suit. So they're <laughs> it's basically just like wearing a t shirt. They're not very thick. <laughs> so the bees can sting right through them. And then my gloves, I don't replace my gloves as often as I should. So they get kinda worn, um, and they'll get kinda thin in places. And so then on the seams or um, where they're kind of worn down, then the bees can sting through that. Um, I had a hole in my veil one time that I didn't know about, and the bee found it, and I got stung in the face. Oh, wow. That was a good time. <laughs> or sometimes your zipper doesn't, like, if you don't zip it up all the way, then they can get in there. But there's other suits that are called ventilated suits, and so they're like a mesh fabric, but they stack it in three layers. So because it's three layers of material it's just um you know the stingers are really tiny i don't know exactly you know the measurement but the three layers of fabric is thicker than the length of the stinger so they just can't penetrate through all three layers it's just not long enough. oh okay but they're like 250 300 dollars dang so if anybody wants to send me one <laughs> but otherwise <laughs> I want to donate yeah. for advertising time. <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll, we'll plug your company in the next episode. In all the episodes, if you send me one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Until it's 10,000 views, then the deal's off. Yeah. But, uh, and, and those ones are nicer because, you know, it gets so hot here. And those ones breathe easier, whereas my full cotton suit uh, doesn't breathe so well. Like yeah, I've, I've always been so paranoid of bees because I was like, I've never been stung in 28 years. Yeah. I'm going to keep it up. I'm never getting stung by a bee ever in my life. Well, most people, but when they get stung, it's by wasps. Really? Because mm -hmm. they're more aggressive. I We had a sandbox when I was little. This has nothing to do with taxes, but it has to do with <laughs> bees, so we'll keep it in. And there was a sandbox in my backyard, and we stopped playing it because we got older. Uh -huh. And we just never maintained it really and then there was like digging wasps that just oh. made a big little nest in there but i still never have never gotten stung yet oh, it's good so well now i feel better because now i know i have like one yep one at fit, least one, one option yeah yeah but i have the, <laughs> realistically the odds of having an anaphylactic response to a bee sting are like slim to none so it's like really nothing to worry about but there's there's always that potential I'm a pretty paranoid person, too, when it comes to health, so that doesn't help me much. Yeah, me, that I'm, me I'm, like, living in a bubble. Yeah. I should go <laughs> skydiving or something and open myself up more. Or I'll take you out to the, the hive sometime. Yeah. I'll put, oh you, I'll put you in a suit. I'll get I'll get my first sting, and then I'll get the second no. one, and then I'll be done for. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, at least you're a paramedic. <laughs> yeah. Well, but paramedics are only as good as their med bag, and I don't exactly. <laughs> I, don't, I can't carry Epi with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll <laughs> oh, I was listening to one of the podcasts, and you were talking about that. I don't know which one. So basically, like an EpiPen is just like adrenaline booster mm -hmm. or something. So Epi epinephrine is the common term, and then the the gosh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Like the um, company. <sighs> so you got your generic, and then you've got your like. Real one, original <laughs> company. I don't know. Expensive trade one? name. The trade oh, name. There you go. <laughs> so you've got your gen your generic is uh, epinephrine, and then the trade name of whichever company owned it. You know, because multiple companies produce epinephrine, but one company called it adrenaline, and then that just kind of oh, okay. is the tr the trade trade term just like you know there's tissues and kleenex lots of people make tissues but only one brand makes kleenex oh that makes sense um but yeah so epi pins i mean it's still epinephrine but um we carry we don't carry just an epi pin we carry vials so we have to like draw it up based on you know the oh, s situation and stuff like so size and weight and stuff like that maybe, for, for kids but we have two different um 
concentrations of 1 to 10,000 and the 1 to 1,000. So it depends on if we're giving it for cardiac arrest or for allergy. And it depends on if we're giving it IV or IM. It's so like a shot in the muscle. So the route and the indication depends on which dosage that we choose. That's crazy. I thought it was, I thought it was like a, like a anti poison medicine or something. It's nope. just adrenaline, I guess, yep. pretty much. Just, just epi, just plain old epi. So for our protocol for allergic reaction is, um, starts with epinephrine and diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Dang. That's and then so interesting. other stuff as well, but. That's our first line. So we need to stop the allergic reaction and reverse the current symptoms. So that's what those two things do. The Benadryl stops it from getting worse and the Epi helps back off some of the um, the swelling and the vasodilatation that occurred. I gotcha. Dang. Okay. Well, I feel a lot better now. Now that I can take one bee sting. You can. And then but high then. alert. <laughs> then it's high alert. <laughs> yeah. Higher alert. Higher. I'm already on high alert. <laughs> I don't know how people get stung by bees, honestly, though. Unless you, I mean, if you're a beekeeper, yeah, it makes sense. But I think a lot of people, most commonly, is um, like people walking around barefoot or in flip flops, and a bee's like foraging oh. a flower, and then they step on it. So a bee will only sting if it's um, needs to defend its colony or its person. I mean. It, or it's itself let's say itself because it's not a person (laughs) so uh you know unless you're like there's a beehive and you know you're throwing rocks at it or something or you're (laughs) too close to it they really they don't need to protect themselves most people aren't near a a hive to get stung in that regard so it's usually a forager bee and they've they're out weeding the garden and accidentally squeeze it or something and it and it stings them in self-defense because once they sting they die their stinger comes out and it kills them so they're they're not going to sting unless it's like that's a pretty cruel mechanism right thanks world yeah (laughs) poor guys so basically just give out oh they're all girls what okay poor girls (laughs) all worker bees are girls so just give out good vibes to the bees and they will leave you alone that's one of the uh biggest things actually that they were teaching in my um the cornell uh online master beekeeper it's not like the only thing but when keeping bees like they can feel like your energy and so if you're anxious and you're slamming them around and stuff then they're going to be aggressive but they can like if you're calm then they kind of feed off that and it keeps them calm i feel like so many animals are like that yeah. like dogs and yeah stuff even. they have like a six sense really yeah like if i'm anxious my dog's anxious i can tell mm-hmm. it's weird he's like on high alert too yeah or something it's so strange yeah i i don't know how they sense it like if it's a pheromone thing or i think it's cool though yeah that's yeah i don't know people are weird animals are weird yeah (laughs) like seizure dogs how you know people we haven't yeah created a machine that you can put on somebody's wrist that detects a seizure but then you have seizure dogs that it can tell we have a dog that starts doing a figure eight race track around yeah. your legs yeah. you're like how's that how right. does that work but yeah that's crazy yeah dogs yeah. are man best friend i guess and women's best friend yes. at this point because we're a gender neutral yes podcast human's episode. best friend yeah there you go <laughs> for those that uh would like to get more information and and maybe get your assistance with their farm how can people find you um, you can go to my website, which should be linked on wherever you're listening. Yeah, we'll put it in the description. And there's a contact us form you can fill out that will send me an email. My phone number is on there, so you can even send me a text or call me uh, and leave a voicemail. I usually don't answer them just because I'm busy, so I usually just have people leave me voice messages. Or send me an email and there should be a link to my instagram account and you can send me a direct message on there i usually check those pretty often so kind of any of the forms really i would say the the best two ways is either call or text or instagram is probably the best bet really um but i check everything every day so part of owning a business right yeah (laughs) so but yeah and and you know i can 
like I said earlier, I pretty much can work with all 50 states, so there's no real restriction. Uh, remote accounting is pretty simple. So Awesome. Yeah, I know you've been a huge help with me, and I know you've saved us a ton of money at the end of the year and stuff, So I, and you're such a great resource to have. So anybody that needs help with farming taxes or, or otherwise, I highly recommend giving Brad a call, and he's been great, and I'm sure he can help anybody else with any of their questions as well so thanks for having me <laughs> it was thanks. fun yeah thanks for being here brad and thanks for listening to backyard bounty and we'll see you again next week thank you for listening to backyard bounty a podcast by heritageacresmarket.com don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review if you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show please email us at ask at heritageacresmarket.com Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.